Chapter Fifteen of the Land of the Broads by Ernest R. Suffling. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Broad District in Autumn, September, October, and November. Come, mellow autumn, with thy morning mist, thy laden orchards and thine eve sun kissed, thy days now shed a ruddy glow around and with a leafy carpet strew the ground september in east anglia is frequently one of the most pleasant months of the whole year the weather is generally warm without the sultriness of july and august and the evenings are generally gloriously calm with brilliant sunsets the one drawback is that the days are not long enough as by the middle of the month night draws its dark veil ere seven o'clock has chimed this is the month par excellence for eels and as night lines are allowed providing they are not armed with more than one hook some good hauls may now be made by those who have patience to bait and lay a couple of dozen of these lines the eels are principally bought up by one yarmouth firm who at intervals send boats to the various rivers and broads and collect them from the various eel sets or netting stations one noticeable feature on the broads in august is now conspicuous by its absence and that is the ever gliding swallow which does not return till the spring comes round again these pretty birds who nightly muster in immense flocks during the summer months have now deserted their haunts and flown far away south to their winter quarters in italy spain and the north of africa how strange it is that these birds after an absence of several months not only return to this country with unerring instinct but in some cases at least actually to the very nests they had occupied during the previous summer this has been repeatedly proved by birds being caught and marked and then released when upon their nests being visited after dark during the following summer the same marked birds have been found the storks of holland migrate in the same way as was proved by a dutch gentleman in eighteen eighty five who fastened a parchment band to a stork's leg requesting any one who might catch it in the winter to attach his name and residence in the spring of eighteen eighty six back came the bird to holland and on being captured while asleep and examined was found to have another docket upon its leg bearing the words in italian i have wintered at florence at the house of signor a during the whole of the autumn if the weather be open and fine fishing may be indulged in especially for pike as these fish do not go to their deep winter habitations until the waters become cold and ice makes its appearance when the weather is cold fishing from a boat is very risky work unless one has an abnormally strong constitution and i would not advise town dwellers to try it if they must fish let it be from the bank where shelter may be obtained or a sharp run or walk indulged in occasionally to circulate the blood perch and rudd are caught in large numbers during september and october and frequently during these months the weather is exceedingly calm and mild as most of the tourists have finished their holidays the broads are again very quiet the visiting season is during the months of june july and august during the other nine months the place is very quiet at the commencement of the shooting season in september the sportsman sometimes packs away his rod and lines in a dry place and unpacks his gun which has for so long lain idle 
now is the season of the dog's delight for they will assuredly have plenty of work to do to retrieve the birds falling amid the reed rons and which would assuredly be lost but for their valuable assistance the navigable rivers being public highways are free to all but many of the broads are preserved for private shooting and persons shooting wildfowl on them may be prosecuted as trespassers the close time for wildfowl is the same here as in other parts of england but i am sorry to find that the law is frequently infringed and that with impunity a shot at a crested grebe or heron seems to be an irresistible temptation to some of the rivermen especially as they find a ready market for any of the rarer specimens of waterfowl they may get even in the off-season money to a poor man is at all times a great temptation and especially is this the case here for these men see money swimming and flying around them all day long in the shape of fish and fowl only this year eighteen eighty six a wherry was stopped by the preservation officers who upon examination discovered a large net dragging astern as she sailed and in her hold a ton and a half of freshwater fish destined for the midland markets there are now several persons who carry on quite a trade in illegally netted fish with birmingham leeds sheffield and other midland towns and who although repeatedly summoned and fined repeat the offence as it pays them great quantities of freshwater fish are consumed by jewish families during lent in certain marshes mushrooms are very plentiful in the autumn so plentiful at times that i have known them fetch only half a crown a bushel september is about the best month for them especially if it be fine with not too much rain there is no objection to any one gathering them on the marshes as they in many cases only spring up to rot again the marshmen very seldom gathering more than enough for their own use what a place for an epicure tender juicy steaks and mushrooms for a relish growing on the same marsh october sees the brewing of some splendid ale which seems to be very much liked by tourists at lakin's brewery in yarmouth it is of quite a different flavour to london beer rather sweeter and strange to say with a decided taste of malt and hops which is so hard to distinguish in the london production one of the sights of yarmouth from august to christmas is the going out and coming in of the fishing fleet which is without exception the largest and finest in the world twenty years since it was difficult to find fishing vessels of more than twenty-five tons burthen but now they are built up to seventy-five and even eighty tons they are moreover fitted with appliances of quite modern construction and invention most of the large vessels carry steam engines for hauling the trawl net pumping and other laborious work thereby saving much time and manual labour the abolition of the cursed coopers or floating public houses and the advent of the mission smacks have greatly contributed to the improvement of the social condition of the hardy and brave north sea fishermen who away in the wild ocean formerly had very little to look forward to except incessant toil and hardship yarmouth autumn races one of the closing events of a very busy season are held on the course between the beach and river near the nelson column the autumn fruit and poultry market is exceedingly well supplied and the neat way the michaelmas geese are dressed is a sight seldom to be seen out of norfolk 
they are picked so clean that it seems hardly possible to imagine they have ever been guilty of a downy existence august and september witness the landing of some tons of oysters which are brought in by the deep-sea trawlers they are large but of a good flavour and cheap seldom more than one shilling per dozen of course nobody thinks of leaving yarmouth without a few of the celebrated bloaters as presents for their friends they are at the best during september when well cured with oak billets they are delicious End of chapter 15chapter sixteen of the land of the broads by ernest r suffling this librivox recording is in the public domain the broad district in winter december january and february come skaters all your jovial prince adore king frost his icy court doth rule once more come glide come gleam in moonlight's cold pale ray come make thy young blood tingle and drive dull care away by e r suffling dwellers in towns who are fond of bodily exertion in the form of skating and other ice games are but too little acquainted with the advantages the broad district offers in this respect here the skater may disport himself over hundreds of acres of ice varying in thickness from a few inches to three foot which has formed on the overflown marshes no dread of death by drowning need haunt him here for he may exercise the graceful gyrations of his fancy and feet without risk of running against or being run into by other skaters and if he choose he may select a spot all to himself and there indulge in his favourite sport to his heart's content for the bolder and perhaps more skilful skater there are scores of miles of river to be traversed though with the drawback of fifteen feet of water if he should go through this very rarely happens however as any tyro can tell when the ice is safe to practice upon in hard winters the broads are frozen over when sleighing and shooting are freely indulged in any one having a friend in the district who would let him know when this occurs might hastily get together a party of ten or a dozen all of whom should be skaters and proceed by an early train from liverpool street next day to norwich whence they could select their own locality for a day or two's good skating a good plan is to have a pair of stout leather boots made with the skates screwed on the soles the irons are usually made on the pattern here shown the boots should be strong lace-ups as they give a great deal more support to the ankles than side springs they can be carried in a small bag and put on or taken off the feet as occasion demands on some good stretches of ice if the company is numerous booths are erected fires lighted steaks cooked and refreshments vended at a reasonable rate the ends of these booths are left open so that skaters may glide in and anchor themselves on upturned barrels which do duty as seats and order any refreshment which they may stand in need of sometimes parties are formed to visit a village on the river some twenty or thirty miles distant and while luncheon is being partaken of the straps of the skates are unbound from the feet of the skater or skateress as the case may be so as to give ease and rest skating matches are of frequent occurrence the course usually being half a mile out and home the turning point being generally marked by a barrel filled with snow 
and with a flag fluttering from a pole thrust into it it does not by any means follow that the first round the turning point wins as it often happens that a competitor having obtained as they say the length of his opponent's foot that is found out his capabilities will make a waiting race of it and only put forth his energy in the last hundred yards or so when he will dart past his opponent like a flash of lightning and win by a yard or two what are the fenmen doing during this arctic weather well these are really hard times with them as all labour has to be stopped and they can only snare and shoot wildfowl this they accomplish by fitting a flat bottom punt with runners of iron or hardwood and filling it with fodder or marsh hay to lie upon and keep themselves warm then in the forepart they erect a screen of rushes firs or twigs with an aperture to see through and an arrangement of cross sticks upon which to rest their fowling pieces their guns are old-fashioned muzzle loaders with enormously long barrels and look as dangerous to the sportsman as to the birds let us watch a gunner and see how he sets about his work see here he comes out of his boat hut from the chimney of which curls the thin blue peat smoke indicating a cosy warmth in his little home he is warmly wrapped up an old white cap is pulled down over his ears a white comforter is folded round his throat and drawn over his clothes is a long white smock reaching below his knees this is his uniform in his mouth is the inevitable stumpy clay pipe a nose warmer about two inches long and as black outside as in over his shoulder is a rope attached to the bow of his punt which he now commences to drag after him over the ice after first carefully depositing his trusty firelock on the cross stand before mentioned presently he comes to a likely place and leaving his boat creeps quietly along to a reed bed and peeps at some objects two or three hundred yards off having satisfied himself as to the identity of these dark objects he comes back to his punt and enters it kneeling in the stern with his face to the bow he then from under the fodder bed draws out two stout sticks shod with iron and taking one in each hand thrusts their points into the ice and quietly propels himself along as he approaches the reed rond by a circuitous route he keeps himself all the time well hidden behind the screen in the bow of his craft when within fifty yards of his unsuspicious victims he lays down his propellers and rests his gun in such a position that it points a couple of feet over the backs of the ducks so as to just catch them as they rise on the wing he then gives a tremendous war whoop and at the same time pulls the trigger of his gun then comes an exciting scene as he chases the wounded birds and wrings their necks some of them having been only slightly hit and giving a long chase before being captured or escaping he then returns to the battlefield collects the dead throws them into the boat reloads his gun and pipe and taking his boat in tow looks out for a fresh shot during any open weather that may occur after christmas reed cutting is commenced and continued till the work is completed in the early spring it is in fact carried on until the sap begins to rise and the young shoots are just appearing the cutting is done either by men who wear large waterproof boots standing in the water or from flat bottom punts or reed boats a plank is used which either projects over the bow of the boat 
or is laid flat on the stumps of the cut reed, which easily support the weight of a man. In cutting, an upward stroke is made with the sickle, the reed being held in bunches by the left hand, and care is taken to cut the reed as far below the water as possible, as a saying prevails that an inch of reed below water is worth two above it. This may be accounted for from the fact that the green part below the water turns, when dry, to a rusty black, becomes as hard as horn, and is, consequently, much more durable when placed upon the roof of a house in the form of thatch, with only these hard butts exposed to the weather. When the boat is properly loaded, it is propelled by a long pole called a quant to the landing place, or, as it is here called, stave, and the reed carefully landed. The reed is then tied into bundles or sheaves of such a size that five of them are of the aggregate circumference of six foot, hence the reason of reed for thatching purposes being sold by the fathom. The method of propagating reed is to separate the root beds at the cutting time, then drag them to favourable positions and anchor them there by means of stout wooden stakes. The roots quickly fasten themselves to the bottom, and very soon the reed spikes are found striking upward. The greatest enemy to the young reed is the starling, which is fond of roosting among it before the stalks are sufficiently strong to bear its weight. It sometimes happens that a reed rond which apparently presents a good crop, is found, upon being cut, to be almost worthless in the interior, from the damage caused by these and other members of the feathered race. Besides reed, the fens grow various other useful plants, which are utilised for many purposes. There is gladden, a coarse kind of reed, with broad blades and pithy stem. This also is used for the purpose of thatching roofs, but, from its more soft and spongy nature, is not nearly so durable as the lordly bowing reed. There are also various kinds of sedge and rushes, used for thatching bullock sheds and outhouses, or as litter for cattle, as well as coarse grass, which, being too rank for cattle provender, is used for bedding. Marsh hay, cut in the summer, is consumed in large quantities by the cattle during the winter. Having exhausted the store of above-ground profitable growths, the natives are, in the summer, often seen going even below the surface for a remunerative article. This is turf, and its lower brother, peat. This peat, or, as it is here called, hovers, is, when properly dried, a capital and economical substitute for coal. It gives off a blue smoke when burning, and this, as it rises from the cotter's chimneys, wafts a rather pleasant perfume in the air, which is a great improvement on the soot-laden, evil-smelling smoke of the metropolis. A peat ground, properly managed, is a rather valuable holding, as may be gathered from the following statistics. The peat blocks, when cut, are about four inches square, shrinking by drying to about three and a quarter inch, by from two foot to two and a half foot long, the depth of the boggy surface soil. Each square foot, therefore, produces nine hovers, each square yard 81, each rod 2450, and consequently each acre the enormous number of 392,000 hovers. As these are retailed at from one shilling to one and six per hundred, a good profit must be realised. In open weather, a great deal of coursing goes on, 
as the Norfolk hares are said to excel all others in size and speed, the latter probably owing to the openness and flatness of the country. These hares are greatly sought after, for turning out at the various coursing meetings held in different parts of England, and their flesh, if we may judge by the placards of the London poulterers who make fine Norfolk hares a speciality, is highly esteemed. Fen hares grow to an enormous size, and are noted for their power of jumping and their endurance over heavy ground. Multitudes of peewits, plovers and wild ducks find their way to the London markets also, and realise good prices during the hard weather. I would point out that, during the prevalence of east winds, the broad district is bitterly cold, and to persons at all weak in the lungs, I would certainly say, go south, rather than to these snow-bound regions. It will be seen, by a study of the meteorological tables, that Norfolk is one of the coldest counties in England during January and February, and one of the hottest during July and August. For the robust, winter here is a most enjoyable time, especially for those who can shoot or skate, and also for the angler. February is considered one of the best months for pike, but at this time the scenery is very tame, flat and colourless. Flocks of wild ducks and geese are frequent visitors to the broads during very severe weather, especially on Alton and Braden. On the coast, line fishing from the shore for codling is a capital amusement. Eighty yards of line, with six or eight hooks attached, baited with lugworms, are thrown out from the shore during a rising tide, and drawn in and examined every few minutes. Good hauls, as much as a man can carry, are often made in four or five hours. Now, having glanced at the attractions presented by the district during the four seasons, I will leave the reader to select his own time and amusements, but I am certain that, whatever month he chooses, he will always find something to attract and amuse him in the land of the broads, whilst, at the same time, he will be recruiting his health. End of chapter 16Chapter 17 of The Land of the Broads by Ernest R. Suffling. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Characteristics and Dialect of East Norfolk Natives. Let not ambition mock their useful toil, their homely joys and destiny obscure, nor grandeur hear with a disdainful smile the short and simple annals of the poor by thomas gray from elegy written in a country churchyard mr marshall the author of the rural economy of norfolk writing in seventeen eighty two thus describes the natives employed upon the farms there is an alertness in the servants and labourers of norfolk which I have not observed in any other district. Whilst a boy, he is accustomed to run at the side of his horses while they trot with the harrows. When he becomes a ploughman, he is accustomed to step out at the rate of three or four miles an hour, and if he drive an empty team, he either does it standing upright in the carriage, with a peculiarity of air, and with a seeming pride and satisfaction, or runs by the side of his horses while they are bowling away at a full trot. Thus, both his body and mind become active, and if he go to mow, reap, or other employment, his habit of activity accompanies him, and is obvious even in his air, his manner, and his gait. 
that the norfolk labourers dispatch more work than those of any other county is an undoubted fact and in this way i think it may be fully accounted for on the contrary a kentish ploughman accustomed from his infancy to walk whether at harrow plough or cart about a mile and a half or two miles an hour preserves the same sluggish step even in his holidays and is the same slow dull heavy animal in everything he does these ideas of the norfolk farmhand are perhaps rather too rosy for him at the present time although he still bears a very high character for honesty sobriety and hard work one hundred years have brought about vast changes in the habits and daily life of an agricultural labourer when mr marshall wrote his work the labourer was a constant boarder with his master he was frequently born on the farm worked on the farm all his life and on the farm died often children born on a farm never left it from cradle to grave they were to a certain extent bondsmen just as the slaves upon a west indian sugar plantation but although unlike them they were free to leave when they pleased seldom changed their masters those were happy days both for masters and men foreign competition both in corn and labour being then unknown wages in those days were in curious contrast to those paid in the present day thus the yearly wages of the following workers were as follows teamerman eight pounds to ten pounds ordinary farmhand four pounds to six pounds a boy two pounds a woman servant three pounds to three pounds three shillings a girl one pound ten shillings to two pounds and their board and lodging in all cases day labourers received one shilling and one penny per day in summer and one shilling per day in winter together with an allowance of beer which was doubtless as small as the pecuniary payment these were the halcyon days of hodge increased wages had brought him no parallel joys for in proportion his money has less purchasing power now than a century ago he is now upon his own responsibility hiring himself to whosoever stands in need of his services and is liable to dismissal at a week's notice compare the present rate of wages with those previous of seventeen eighty two and it will be seen that the poor fellow's rate of remuneration has not kept pace with the times the following is the present wage list with which hodge has to feed and clothe himself wife and family and pay rent the yearly wages of the following workers are now teamerman thirty one pounds four shillings to thirty three pounds sixteen shillings ordinary labourer twenty six pounds to thirty one pounds four shillings boy five pounds four shillings to ten pounds eight shillings woman servant six pounds to eight pounds including board girl three pounds to six pounds including board in consequence of these low wages which barely serve to keep body and soul together nearly all the able-bodied men either seek work in the large english towns emigrate to distant colonies or as is the case with the majority become fishermen the farmer's loss is thus the country's gain for the north sea fishery is of world-wide celebrity as a school for seamen it must not be understood from the above remarks 
that the Norfolk farm servants are a horde of feeble, old, or crippled men. Far from it. Though the present representatives are not to be compared to those of former days. Five out of six of those who emigrate alight on their feet, as they express it, that is, meet with the success their enterprise deserves. Indeed, some of them have, in a few years, gathered together, by frugality and perseverance, a comfortable competency. Those who have the hardihood to seek their living upon the sea are much better off than their land brethren, but, at the same time, run great risks from the gales which always occur in the North Sea during the herring harvest, that is, from August to Christmas. Every season sees some of the poor fellows mourned for in their native villages. Sometimes, indeed, a great wail goes up from these bereft villages, as, for instance, during the October gale of 1883, when no less than 210 lives were lost, and a fund for the maintenance of the widows and orphans was opened at the London Mansion House. The fisherman's life is a hard one, and only the strong can withstand the toil and exposure consequent upon its pursuit. A peculiarity to be noted is that those men who, at the beginning of the fishing season, come from the plough to join the fleet, and are usually, from their sparse living, thin, after being aboard a smack for a few weeks, get so much heavier and stouter that they can hardly be recognised as the same individuals. This results from the increased appetite created by the briny atmosphere, and their consequent ability to consume an unlimited supply of fish and pork, the staple food. The strength and spirits increase in a like ratio, and at the making up time, at Christmas, when the season's earnings are doled out, these men are, to all intents, superior in body and mind to poor droning Hodge, who has remained ashore during these five active months of the fisherman's life. The pay of these fishermen is proportioned to the takes of fish and the prices realised. Thus, when the accounts are made up at the end of the season, the net profits are divided into so many shares, according to pre-arrangement. For skipper, nine hands and a boy, the sharing out would be something on this plan. The sum would be divided into eighteen equal shares. Three of these would be a portion for the vessel, three for the nets, two for the skipper, one and a half for the mate, one for each of the hands, and the odd half for the boy. These are not the exact proportions, but will serve to show the manner in which the profits are allotted. It will thus be seen that it is to the interest of each member of the crew to contribute to the success of the voyage by every means in his power. Of course, luck has to a great extent to do with the success or non-success of the fishing, as at times, toil as the men may, they get but a poor return for their labour, while on other occasions they meet with many good takes of fish in a season. A good season is often sufficient to give each man from thirty pounds to sixty pounds as his portion. The great breweries, especially all sops, and the various railways employ large numbers of East Norfolk men, who are found to be very civil, industrious, and tractable. The latter trait is a great consideration, where large bodies of men are employed, and the overseers, knowing this, prefer these men to those of almost any other county, as they have much less trouble with them. The natives are exceedingly superstitious, even in these days of enlightenment, but doubtless much of this is due to ignorance, 
which the board schools will probably assist in dissipating here are a few of these superstitions one if a crow croaks over a house someone will die there within twelve months two nobody ever thinks of buying or selling or commencing any new undertaking on a friday three when going to market to sell corn or oxen if you meet a cross-eyed man or woman you had better return as your dealing will not prosper four poppies brought into a house cause the occupants headaches and fainting five primroses carried into a house bear ill luck with them six if a bough of yew be brought into a house at christmas one of the inmates will die ere another noel comes round seven if a red bee flies in at the open window a male visitor will pay a visit if a white one a lady will call eight st mark's night april fifth is considered to be a favourable time for spells to be cast and for uncanny sights to be seen if one has the courage to go alone to the porch of the village church on st mark's night he will see pass before him at midnight the shadowy forms of those who are to die before the next easter some also say that those in the village who are to have a serious illness during the same period will be seen nine if a mother being an unmarried girl or young woman goes into the garden at twelve o'clock on st mark's night and uses the following spell her future husband will appear with a scythe in his hand she must sow some hemp seed and as she sows must keep repeating these lines hemp seed i sow hemp seed come grow he that is my true love come arter me and mow then the ghostly lover mows or would do so if he ever appeared ten here is another charm the maiden sits before a mirror in her bedroom in which must only be one candle shedding a dim light at twelve o'clock she says come lover come lad and make my heart glad for my husband i'll have you for good or for bad then the future spouse looks over the maiden's shoulder into the glass several fatal jokes have been the outcome of these ghostly incantations goblins and fairies are of course firmly believed in and many legends are told about white ladies shuck dogs and shrieking women some of these are very quaint and show by their style that they are of ancient origin witchcraft is still to a great extent believed in and the look of an evil eye still causes a spell to be placed upon the unfortunate person displeasing the owner of the said malevolent optic several cases of this kind have come under the writer's immediate notice one of which he took the trouble to thoroughly investigate the person upon whom the spell was supposed to be cast was a farm labourer of about fifty-five years of age this man on a certain occasion drove his team to north walsham and in going into the town nearly ran over an old man near the bend of a road the old man glared at him shook his stick and muttered something which k the teamster could not catch that was enough the spell had been cast and sure enough the next day it worked k while at work in a field took out his ancient watch to see the time it was eleven the hour when on the previous day he nearly ran over the old man he put the watch away and immediately after felt giddy and ill and remembered no more till he found himself in bed at home 
whither he had been carried by his comrades. He soon recovered, but on the following day, when the fatal hour of eleven arrived, was again struck down and taken home, where he soon regained his usual health. He dreaded going to work the third day, but went and watched nervously the approach of eleven. His anxiety as the hour approached was very great, so much so that when the time actually came, he was powerless from apprehension and soon after fainted away. I mentioned the case to a medical friend of mine who saw the man and pronounced it a case of epilepsy. He gave the man some physic and a phial of dark liquid, a black draught, which he was to take at 10.55 the next morning after making the sign of the cross over it. He took it and never since has he been troubled with the evil eye, although he firmly believes in it, and will do so, I have no doubt, in spite of all argument, to his dying day. We now return to consider the past and present state of the Norfolk peasant. With a change of style in farming, and in everything else, he also has changed men and customs are entirely altered from those obtaining in the days of our grandfathers then the stubble was left after cutting with the reaping hook eighteen inches and even two foot high now the machine reaper crops it off close to the ground and so abridges the days of harvest from six or seven weeks to just half that time our grandsires did all farm work by hand and required a large number of men now everything is done by machine threshing winnowing turnip hoeing and cutting sowing haymaking corn cutting and binding corn and straw stacking breaking oil cake and a score more things are all done by machine to the exclusion of a great deal of manual labour. Still, the natives are far from being a discontented people, be they fenmen, fishermen, or farm men, and as with the advent of the board schools, the light of education has dawned upon them. All those under the age of about thirty years are grounded in at least the three R's many of the words in use among the people are very old indeed some of them are pure saxon a perusal of the following list may perhaps be of interest to those who are curious in the matter of english etymology glossary of norfolk words beck a rivulet bestow to stow away Bin, a manger or cow crib. Bishop Barnaby, the ladybird. Boar, a contraction of neighbor, as, how are you, boar? Broad, a freshwater lake, the broadening of a river in distinction from narrow waters or rivers. Buddle, the corn marigold. Chrysanthemum sagittum. Buds yearling cattle cadder a jackdaw canker a caterpillar cankerweed common ragwort senecio jacobea cast yield of corn causey a causeway cloat the coltsfoot plant tussilago farfara cob a seagull cocky the grate over a sewer, coxheads, the ribwort grass, plantago, lanceolata, colder, the debris of straw after threshing, croom, anything hooked, as a turnip croom, a stick handle, crowd, or too crowd, to wheel in a barrow, dannocks, hedging gloves, deek, a hedge bank at the foot of which is the hole or ditch. Dicky, a donkey. Dindles, 
common sow thistle sonchus oleraceus dingle to hang down dodman a snail dole to portion out or to divide dole stone a landmark or boundary stone dos or to dos to toss with the horns or gore dow the ring dove dwile a dishcloth dydal to bail out or to empty fall gate a gate across a public road fay or to fay to cleanse out as a well or tub forzes the four o'clock meal gain handy convenient docile ungain the reverse gladden common cat's tail typha latifolia golder or to golder to gossip goose tansy the silver weed potentilla ansirina gotch a jug or pitcher grissons the stairs or staircase hain to raise either the rent or the stack or building hake a pothook heck a half door helve the handle of any implement hilda the elder tree hobbardy a lad or a boy man hobby a hack or common horse hull a ditch at the side of a field hulled through hulva the holly tree jiffle to fidget jimmers door hinges journey half a day's work at plough or carting kedgy lively or sprightly keeping room the parlour or sitting room killer a small tub kindling firewood knacker a horse collar maker laid just frozen slightly frozen water is said to be laid largesse a gift or a reward lashy cold wet weather is said to be lashy loke a narrow lane lope to take long strides in walking mardle gossip mavish the thrush mawther an unmarried girl muck any kind of manure muckweed the goosefoot chenopodium album mumps mummers needleweed shepherd's needle scandix pecten veneris knockle a maul or mallet nog strong beer noonings the midday meal or dinner olland unbroken meadowland old land owl's crown wood cudweed napphalium silver tycum packway a bridle path pad or ped a wicker hamper palk wreckage par yard cattle yard or straw yard paxwax gristle pick purse common spurry spergula arvensis pital a small field or a croft pishmire the ant plancher the chamber floor poke a sack or bag pollen or hen pollen the hen roost pulk a puddle push a boil quicks couch grass triticum repens ranny the little field mouse redweed round-headed poppy papaver rheus ringe a row of potatoes or corn etc roke mist or fog rowan aftermath or second grass crop scotches notches seal 
time or season as hay seal or hay time bark seal or time of tree barking what seal a day is it that is what is the time shack to turn cattle out to graze after the corn has been carted to wander and feed at will thus a tramp is called a shack shanny mad shuck the shell of peas or to shell anything shug to shake or scatter skep a beehive or a lidless basket skink to serve out anything as in beer etc scriggle to squirm like an eel slade a sledge slake idle or at leisure sluss dirty water or mire spurket a pothook spolt breaking off short or brittle applied to wood squinder to burn inwardly as charcoal etc stark stiff or tight stulp a post of any kind stuggy strongly built or well knit suckling white clover trifolium repens swidge a puddle team five horses two for morning work two for afternoon work and one taking a daily turn of rest or grazing teamerman a wagoner the caretaker of horses on a farm teeth manure thack to thatch or a thaxter or thatcher thapes gooseberries vance roof a garret winter weed ivy leaved speedwell veronica hedary folia wisp a seaton or rowl retweed sunspurge euphorbia helioscopia writ a wart in thirty nine out of the forty english counties people speak but in the fortieth they sing the singing county is suffolk norfolk people have not the peculiar singing speech of the suffolk natives their dialect however is full of rising inflections which make it a very difficult one for persons to imitate successfully they pronounce the a dreadfully long in all words in fact as we pronounce it in fate but with the addition of an e before the long a h is pronounced more like each than the town h o like the o in move r has the sound of air v is usually given the same sound as sam weller would have given it namely we y has a broad sound something like y from their peculiar manner of pronouncing certain words norfolk men may always be detected if you shake hands with a norfolk man he will at once ask how are you or how do you do the o in such words as to to do you is invariably changed into you in certain words no difference of pronunciation can be observed thus hair hair or here are all hair bear bear and bear are alike bear the final g is usually absent and thus we have runnin comin jumpin fightin for running coming jumping and fighting in one particular norfolk natives certainly have the laugh at londoners and that is in the use of the ill-treated letter h they seldom misplace it and as an aspirate it receives its due force of sound another feather in the caps of the norfolkese 
is that their vocabulary does not contain the number of slang words usually met with in counties containing a number of large towns they seldom pronounce the h after t thus they say tree true and tro for three through and throw speaking of a vocabulary it may be noted that from eight hundred to one thousand words constitute the whole of the norfolk native stock of english words in fact in ordinary conversation they have a way when at a loss for a word of coining one in stanta such words are usually comprehended by their listeners and thus get them over an awkward pause in their narrative they have curious ways of constructing some of their sentences ways that are not accidental but habitual with them thus they would instead of saying you go to the shop put it in this form do you go to the shop and the reply would not be no you go but no go you the verbs rarely have the s added to the plural thus our native would say that dog run fast or if he come now he will be in time it is a difficult thing to give an absolutely correct idea of the dialect of a county in print as the modulation and inflection of the voice which give character to the speech are entirely wanting here however is a slight attempt to show those who are unacquainted with the dialect what it is like two old neighbours meet on a cold winter's morning and address each other thus well neighbour seely and how do you fare to feel this sort of weather saddler bore saddler what with weather and warrants i'm almost dead why what's amiss wi ye everything bore i hain't much time to golder but howsomdever i'll tell ye fust my mother abigail trod on her frock and hulled herself downstairs last night and dropped the candle in course and set fire to herself and in a jiff she flew all of a fire and afore i could throw my old fust and cut on to her all the hair was burnt off her head lavin it as bald as a lard bladder then in the night my old dicky got over the deek and fall into the hull in cubit's pital and there she lay till the mornin dare say they do say misfortunes never come single ay but that ain't all that boy tummer mine's gone and got married unbeknown to me and came a marchin his gal hum yesterday at noon time as bold as brass i could hardly believe my seven senses but the gal out with her marriage lines and in course that proved it but tell you me bore what make you so livelier well you see the truth is my old woman's gone up to lunnon for a month so i'm a gay young bachelor again bore do you see eh etc etc the names of norfolk rivers are many of them euskardian or iberian in their derivation thus we have from these sources the bure glavin x ant neen nar thurn waveney wensum yare thet or chet ooze and others the names of most of the villages are of british derivation except those bordering on the east coast which are frequently danish in fact the east coast natives are descendants of the old danish sea kings who landed upon the coast and there settled the type of their features is certainly danish straight noses open frank countenances blue or grey eyes fair skin ruddy complexion 
and straw-coloured hair their language is also interspersed with semi-danish words and the accent and pronunciation are by reasons of their danish extraction unlike those of any other english dialect most of the danish sea kings and their followers had particular cognomens by which they were known irrespective of their family names such as sea wolf foam born the dragon etc and this custom has been handed down to the present generation as nearly every man has a soubriquet or nickname the martial or sublime of the danish names has however descended to the ridiculous as a sample of a few nicknames will show thus in one village you may meet Calabac Seely, Punks Wiseman, Tightskin Hewson, T. Helsden, Two Skull Thompson, Bumble Peggs, Splayfoot Wilson, Whale Thatcher, Pretty Mouth Mason, Blue Nose Wayland, Prickleback Long, and so on. Most of these names are given to their recipients when boys, usually from some physical peculiarity and are retained by them to the grave when these men go to sea or enter into the employment of any firm such as a brewery these nicknames take the place of their baptismal names and by them and frequently by them alone they are known it is necessary therefore if you wish to find a man say aboard a smack to know his extra appellation and instead of asking for william so-and-so to simply inquire for leather lungs etc as the case may be as the family name is probably unknown to the rest of the crew the dress of the natives is not of any particular peculiarity except in one or two points the long sleeve waistcoat is worn by most of them it is of somewhat peculiar make being very long in the body so as to come well over the hips the front is of velveteen with plenty of buttons and the back and sleeves which reach quite to the wrist are of jean the turnover of the cuffs is also of velveteen when the wearer is at all a bow the long smock with its elaborate breastwork so well known in many parts of england is almost absent here but its place is taken by the slop which is in make exactly like the french blouse but is white or nearly so in colour it is a simple square-cut garment with a hole in the top for the head to come through and baggy sleeves fastened at the wrist with a button this is a very sensible garment for field work buskins are usually worn in wet weather and stout hobnail boots encase the feet the head has a billycock hat of a flexible felt which may be worn in a number of ways according to the fancy of the owner sometimes the hat is worn a la brigand with one side of the brim cocked up and the other down sometimes with the back of the brim curled up and the front thrust out like a peak a la mephistopheles and in many other ways in wet weather it is turned down all round and looks like the roof thatch on a round stack but answers its purpose admirably as a shelter from the rain it is a hat for all weathers contrast it with the fine weather glossy silk hat of the town man the supposed mark of respectability and i am afraid for utility and comfort the latter will only be second the amphibious portion of the semi-nautical population affect a kind of half sailor rig a guernsey jersey it is called in london covers the upper man thick blue-black cloth trousers encase his lower extremities and half wellington or deck boots cover his feet when at field work he dons the slop and the billycock 
and his dress is complete it matters not how the men are dressed or where they are seen the seafaring man who works part of his time on the farm can be detected at a glance from the purely agricultural labourer let half a dozen of them walk a short distance and the difference in their gait and carriage is seen at once the labourer being used to walking over ploughed and soft land takes a long slow stride with his shoulders forward and his arms swinging like pendulums by his side the fisherman labourer takes shorter steps rolls in his gait and turns his elbows out from his sides and usually turns the backs of his hands to the front he is usually the smarter man of the two as seeing about him brightens his ideas gives him a better flow of language and makes him more intelligent in every way to his fellow workmen who vegetates in one spot all his life there is one peculiar article of dress that may be noted and that is the collar the sunday collar if you please as during the week a coloured handkerchief wound round the neck like a rope takes its place it is fastened by a button in front then passed backwards round the neck the strings again brought to the front and there tied should a button fastening an ordinary collar come off a man a town man is helpless but in this one if a string gives way a piece of twine or part of a bootlace is spliced on and all is well again funerals are conducted here in a very simple but nevertheless impressive manner after being used to our larger metropolitan cemeteries with their numerous throngs of gaping spectators many of whom are simply drawn to the graveside from idle curiosity and who stare at the mourners and their grief as at a rarey show it is a very solemn and touching sight to witness a country funeral let us stand aside by yon epitaph and inscription begirt column and witness the burial of a farm bailiff's little daughter near the flint-built wall the tiny grave is dug not the deep dark chasm we town dwellers are used to gaze down into with fear lest the crumbling sides give way and precipitate one to the bottom with a broken limb but a neatly dug resting place not more than five foot in depth for here but one body rests in each grave the sexton has finished his task of digging and wiping his hot face for it is summer time unrolls his upturned sleeves dons his coat again and enters the church from the tower of which is presently heard the dismal and solemn tolling of the passing bell a few persons both men and women attired in their darkest clothes as they have not all black ones now begin to cluster near the grave to await the coming of the funeral cortege their conversation is in a subdued key but presently there is a stir among them for in the distance some half mile off a confused assemblage of persons is seen slowly wending its way along the footpath across the fields gradually they draw nearer and nearer and as they approach take shape as an orderly procession partly white and partly black in colour as they draw nearer to the churchyard a flutter of white linen is seen in the porch and the parson with bare head and book in hand advances to the gate to meet the procession first come the schoolfellows of the dead child each with an offering of wild and garden flowers then the friends of the family immediately followed by four girls of twelve or fourteen years of age each sustaining the corner of a large white cloth in the centre of which lies the coffin nearly hidden by flowers 
following closely in pairs are the father and mother sisters and brothers and other relatives of the little one whose voice will never again be heard singing in the green fields or in the old thatched church the choir of which she constantly attended a host of villagers bring up the rear the solemnity of the occasion being apparent in their very gait and whispered words as they gather at the graveside the voice of the parson breaks the stillness of the air for all is now silent save the song of the birds who carol sweetly as if the uprising of the little soul in its heavenward flight were a thing of joy to them the harvestmen building their corn stack in the adjoining field pause in their labour and reverently doff their hats as they await with down-bent heads the conclusion of the ceremony many a tear from the eyes of the brave fishermen and farm men standing within the sacred acre bedews the soil and when the dull thud of the earth to earth resounds on the coffin lid a shudder of awe seems to run through the gathered villagers at length the service is finished and the broken-hearted father consoles his half-fainting wife and sobbing children as they slowly wend their way homeward leaving the throng after a last look at the little white coffin to disperse quietly to their respective homes and the sexton to finish his task at his leisure hearses being unknown in these villages all adults are carried to their last resting place upon a cart that is if the distance be more than about a third of a mile if less a buyer is requisitioned and four or six bearers carry the coffin a simple band of black round the hat and sleeve is the only mourning worn if the deceased be a little girl a narrow slip of white material is worn at the back of the men's hat bands as a symbol of the spotless innocence of the departed little one for the grandees of the district muffled peals are frequently rung which have a very curious and striking effect when heard for the first time the muffling is effected by tying pieces of sacking or carpet on one side of the clapper of each bell the bells are then rung in sequence and give forth their full sound but on being struck by the other or muffled side of the clapper a very subdued sound is produced giving the effect of the note being produced at a great distance in comparison to the first or full notes the effect of the soft pedal of a pianoforte gives something of the idea of the muffled peal but does not subdue or blur the tone nearly enough as this chapter is getting like witherington in the ballad of chevy chase that is into the doleful dumps we will change the subject and turn from the dead to the living as living suggests food we will see in what respect that which is consumed here differs from that in other parts of the realm first comes the space-filling or satisfying norfolk dumpling which is the simplest possible article of manufacture in the pudding line flour yeast water and a pinch of salt properly compounded and popped in the pot for neither more nor less than twenty minutes suffice to produce a pudding fit for a king or a ploughman it is strange how few londoners can make these dumplings properly they are either too large or too small too heavy too little cooked or too little something which just spoils them the norfolk women have the necessary knack of making them and know to a nicety by a kind of instinct the exact size to make them for as they roll them in their hands into a globular form they usually nip a little piece off 
or add a small piece to keep them to the orthodox dimensions pork and apple pie is another favourite and has a crust neither thicker nor thinner than the sole of the goodman's shoe which is tantamount to saying that there is something substantial to bite at the pork and apples are put into the dish in alternate layers until the dish is full when the cover of dough is placed over and the whole baked in a huge brick oven this dish sometimes overcomes weak or bilious stomachs pumpkin and apple pie alternate layers of each is another favourite and is eaten with plenty of pepper which is sprinkled over each layer pumpkin and raisin pie with pepper seasoning is another dish of the same class sausages always pork are liked baked in a batter in which they appear like ships in a troubled sea this is called toad in the hole and is very good although somewhat rich experto creed frumity or firmity is new wheat boiled in milk until it bursts and assimilates with the milk it is then eaten with sugar and i should think would form one of the most nutritious things a person or children could possibly consume when left to cool it sets in a beautiful thick jelly the grand time for feasting is at pig killing time and then numbers of queer dishes are concocted from the interior and exterior of the porker chitterling and apple pie is a great favourite scraps is another this is made by saving all the little bits of fat from all parts of the animal and frying them till most of the grease has run out when of a delicate brown they are eaten with a little salt and much gusto to the wonder of the town looker-on who sits by wondering how the eaters can keep them down in the way of drink the natives are not at all particular their summer tipple being very thin small beer of which they consume large quantities especially in the harvest field the labourers are usually allowed a certain amount of porter during harvest time this is given at eleven a m when they have their lavenses and at four p m when they have their forzes mead is another drink and is made by those of the cottagers who keep bees it is a very sweet and when good intoxicating drink it is made in a very simple manner as will be seen from the following recipe in ten gallons of water well mix the whites of five or six eggs and add fifteen pounds of honey boil this mixture for not more than an hour and add according to taste some spice cinnamon mace ginger cloves etc pour the liquor into a large wooden tub and when nearly cool add enough yeast to set it working when fermentation has ceased put it into a barrel which tightly bung after keeping in a cellar for six months it may be bottled for use this quantity will make about five dozen bottles this quality is seldom made by the villagers and had not need be or the list of drunken disorderly charges would be increased about five pounds of honey to ten gallons of water is nearer the proportion to produce cottage mead mead was the old scandinavian drink pearl is a winter early morning drink it is made of ale with a soupçon of rum or other spirits in it a little spice is also added and the whole then placed in a warmer over the fire it is kept continually stirred with a bunch of dried wormwood until sufficiently warm and bitter the natives are very fond of this tonic on one occasion 
two of my friends expressed their wish to try some we accordingly adjourned to a tavern near norwich and ordered a glass each it was made and brought in good health was nodded by each to other and a sip taken no more each looked at the other with a look as much as to say i'm poisoned on his face after enjoying the scene for some time i found breath enough to ask them what they thought of it one a cambridge student fresh from his studies said it is not quite the drink of the gods nectar but if ever the devil takes a quiet glass this is his tipple number two a medical student gave it as his opinion that it was the finest and most irresistible emetic he had ever tasted two millers just then came in the pearl was handed to them and was out of sight and finished with a smack of the lips before any one could cry jack robinson so much for taste it no doubt creates a good appetite in those who can take it for as one of the millers said a glass of pearl before breakfast will make a man eat bricks in a tavern of which i have forgotten the locality is a puzzle made up of rows and columns of random words to decipher it is necessary to commence with the last word in the right hand column and read upward then by reading the other columns in the same way the verse will be discovered which is my brewer has sent his clerk and i must pay my score and if i trust my beer what shall i do for more many old ditties of a bacchanalian character are still extant and there are also a great number of sea songs which are sung over and over again and handed down from father to son ballads of all kinds are the favourite songs for saturday night which is the regular singing night in all the inns these are interspersed with step dancing and yarns oh so tough the dancing is usually performed upon the bar table which is placed in the centre of the room so that all may have a fair view often two dancers will appear on the same table and dance the longest and strongest for a quart of ale he who gives in first loses they clatter away with their hobnail pumps till the perspiration trickles down their faces and every now and then a mug of ale is handed to each of them for a cooler which has to be drunk without a pause in their exercise if one slackens his step loud exclamations of dissent are immediately raised by the partisans of his opponent this dance of asses goes on till one of them fails from sheer exhaustion and the other slips off the table on to a settle amid the shouts of his applauding friends to while away the monotony of this business someone usually obliges with a song and being in an inn and inclined we will hear one of these a drinking song the pie on the pear tree the pie sit on the pear tree top the pear tree top the pear tree top i hold you a crown she is coming down she is coming down she is coming down i hold you a crown she is come down she is come down she is come down so lift up your elbow and hold up your chin and let your next neighbour just joggle it in the song once again but this time detailing the author's description of the singer's actions the pie on the pear tree the pie sit on the pear tree top the singer holds up a glass of ale the pear tree top the pear tree top 
i hold you a crown she is coming down she is coming down she is coming down the singer brings the glass slowly down i hold you a crown she is come down she is come down she is come down the singer hands the glass to his neighbour so lift up your elbow and hold up your chin and let your next neighbour just joggle it in the singer joggles the drinker so that he may not drink the proffered draught sometimes the songs instead of being of a bacchanalian order are quite learnedly historic if perhaps a little boastful but perhaps county pride is after all the prerogative of an englishman here is one of these loyal lays the men of norfolk come sing a lay of norfolk sons and troll their fame in verse and song recounting doughty deeds they've done on sea and land with courage strong we'll sing our strain both bold and clear where'er we roam on cliff or lee so loud our voices let us raise that foes may hear across the sea chorus for the lads who speed the plough hurrah and for those who toil on the sea if war should come to the tap of the drum they would march and merry be to england's aid in rank arrayed they are first in the battle's roar for on land or sea or where'er they be they are ever to the fore brave boys our lads are to the fore long ages past fierce romans came with mighty hosts upon our shore then norfolk's men rose in their might and marshland men prepared for war a battle fought and victory gained for many a thousand foemen fell bodicea may thy name in english hearts forever dwell chorus for the lads who speed the plough etc etc long years rolled by the normans crossed and in our island made a stand the fenmen stout resistance made and fought the foe with bow and brand st bennet's abbey long maintained unequal strife with mail-clad men till treachery the gate unbarred the normans conquered only then chorus for the lads who speed the plough etc etc to norfolk's brave old warrior we must give remembrance for i trow that frenchmen in good henry's reign were certainly our direst foe sir john fastolf at agincourt against alenson ran full tilt and prisoner home the frenchman brought whose ransom cased a castle built chorus for the lads who speed the plough etc etc in good queen bess's lengthened reign the fleet called the armada came whose spanish captains all so bold had threatened us with sword and flame but britain's seamen undismayed arose their country to defend while yarmouth's gallant ships and men helped back to spain the dons to send chorus for the lads who speed the plough etc etc to norfolk's hero render song at nelson's name let shouts be raised for deeds of valour such as his should by his countrymen be praised trafalgar's crowning glory is by englishmen held ever dear more so by norfolk's sturdy sons who lost their hero fighting there chorus for the lads who speed the plough etc etc the author has provided a number of footnotes for some of the lines of the song to england's aid in rank arrayed they are first in the battle's roar general wyndham a norfolk man 
led the troops to the assault of the Redan in the Crimean War, and the Norfolk regiments were conspicuous for their bravery. Long ages passed, fierce Romans came, with mighty hosts upon our shore. Julius Caesar landed in Britain, B.C. 55. A battle fought and victory gained, for many a thousand foemen fell. Bodicea, widow of Prasutagus, king of the Iceni, or ancient inhabitants of Norfolk, and whose stronghold was at Kenninghall, roused to revenge by the outrages of the Romans upon herself and daughters, marched upon Camaladunum, modern-day Colchester, and slaughtered the garrison, and then upon Londinium, modern-day London, which she took and reduced to ashes, besides slaughtering 70,000 Romans and their allies. The remains of her encampment still exist at Kenninghall. Bodicea, may thy name in English hearts forever dwell. Bodicea was defeated soon after, and her followers slain. She saved herself only by flight, but, fearing to fall into the hands of the enemy, poisoned herself in 61 AD. St. Bennet's Abbey long maintained unequal strife with mail-clad men, till treachery the gate unbarred, the Normans conquered only then. The story of the taking of St. Bennet's Abbey appears in chapter 8. For I trow that Frenchmen in good Henry's reign, King Henry V. Sir John Fastolf at Agincourt. Sir John Fastolf, or Fostalf, born 1377 at Yarmouth, died 1459, and is buried in St. Nicholas Church, Yarmouth. He must not be confounded with the braggadocio Sir John Falstaff of Shakespeare's dramas. Sir John Fastolf at Agincourt, against Alençon ran full tilt, and prisoner home the Frenchman brought, whose ransom cased a castle built. It is said that the Duke de Alençon was taken prisoner by Sir John and brought to England, where, as a ransom, he built Caister Castle as a residence for his captor. I cannot see how this could be, as Alençon died by the hand of the English king on the field of battle. While Yarmouth's gallant ships and men, Yarmouth is said to have sent many vessels manned by the hardy Norfolk fishermen to help Her Majesty against her Spanish foes. To Norfolk's hero render song, at Nelson's name let shouts be raised. Nelson was born at Burnham Thorpe, a hamlet in the north of Norfolk. End of chapter 17Chapter 18 of The Land of the Broads by Ernest R. Suffling. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Fish of the Broads and How to Catch Them. Now, away to the broad, with our tackle all stored. Here's a day that's worth a day's wishing. See that all things be right, for twould be a spite to want tools when a man goes a fishing. By Charles Cotton, localized version. As I do not lay claim to being either an Isaac Walton, Cotton, or Pennell, I shall not attempt in this chapter to write learnedly like those noted anglers upon the various methods of taking fish, but shall simply give a glance at the fish themselves and offer a few notes and suggestions on angling which will i think be sufficient for the general tourist and casual piscator the species of fish which are to be found in the broads and rivers are but few though what is lacking in variety is certainly made up for in number trout gudgeon dace 
and other well-known river fish appear to be very scarce in these waters but the shoals of perch roach rudd bream and eels are simply astounding netting and poaching the fish was carried on to such an alarming extent a few years since that the broads threatened in a few years to become depopulated of their finny inhabitants tons and tons of fish which could not be sold was simply used for manure and capital manure it was found to be but what a waste of good food some ten or twelve years since several gentlemen by bringing the matter before parliament were enabled to get a bill passed which has had the effect of nearly stopping this wanton destruction the broads are now fast regaining their normal number of fish though these appear to run small a natural result of so many thousands of the larger and older ones being destroyed every year however adds to the size weight and number of fish and in a few years more with careful watching the waters will be as well stocked as in the days of yore as the roach of all the freshwater fish requires the most delicate skill to capture we will see first how he is to be lured to his doom silently and quickly the roach luciscus rutilus is in form too well known to need description when this fish is in good condition the head is one-fifth of the entire length and the depth at the juncture of the dorsal fin two-fifths of the length of the body that is minus head and tail the spawning season is about the latter end of may or in late seasons the beginning of june the roach is a very prolific fish in the ovary of one weighing one and a half pounds no less than one hundred and twenty five thousand eggs were counted as a table fish though not so fine as many others inhabiting fresh water it is when properly cooked toothsome enough it is in finest flavour in october its flesh being then firmer than at any other period the roach does not attain to any great size usually running from seven inches or eight inches to one foot though specimens have been taken fifteen inches in length and weighing two and a half pounds the best months for taking the roach are july august and september and for the enthusiast october a fairly long but light rod will be required with a thin running line to which should be attached five yards or six yards of gut and for ordinary sized fish a number ten or number eleven hook for large fish a hook one size larger may be used as the roach bites very delicately a very small quill float will suffice with just enough shot above the hook to sink the line and leave the float partly on its side the water should neither be too turbid nor too rough or the shy nibbles of these fish will not be readily detected the best bait for these waters appears to be paste which may be made of simple dough amongst which has been finely and intimately mixed a small proportion of cotton wool which will make it adhere more firmly to the hook some prefer to colour the paste with a little vermilion but this gives it a wormy appearance and roach are not such great lovers of worms as perch still it would not be a bad idea to take a small quantity of each and try which is the more killing what will lure one day will be found of little avail on another occasion gentles in their white state are often very efficacious they may be kept until they assume a red hue which is the chrysalis state when at certain times they will be eagerly taken 
the objection to the red gentleman is that their outer case being hard and brittle difficulty is experienced in keeping them on the hook now if you wish to have a good day's sport it is imperative that the swim be ground baited for some distance round either the night before or very early on the morning of the day selected for angling a good ground bait is made thus take a number of lobworms and chop them up into pieces one quarter or one third of an inch in length now mix them thoroughly in sand or light clay so that plenty of it adheres add a very small quantity of boiled rice or barley and make the whole into balls as large as a boy's fist throw these balls into the water where you intend to fish twenty-four hours beforehand if practicable another ground bait is made by mixing well-soaked bread crumbs and bran together and adding a handful of brewer's grains this when well worked together may be rendered heavy by the addition of a little clay or loam make into large balls and cast into the proposed swim roach are very gregarious fish and on the following morning will be found to have congregated in large numbers about the ground bait having carefully plumbed the depth allow the bait upon your hook just to clear the bottom by an inch or two if fishing from a boat be careful not to make a noise with your feet or drop anything as wood being a conductor of sound conveys the slightest noise to the fish if you must talk do so in a low tone be careful to have a landing net handy as even a medium-sized fish will be sure to break your delicate tackle if not properly landed if a large fish say one of two pounds in weight the top joint of the rod would break under the strain if no net were employed it sometimes happens that when a roach is being landed a pike will make a grab at it and if he gets it in his mouth then goodbye line and float farewell top joint and best part of rod and a due sport at this particular spot for some time to come the yellow or dung fly is sometimes a useful bait and should be tried roach will sometimes rise at this if it be gently dangled along the surface of the water they will rise near it closer and closer till with a loud flop they are hooked and landed the angler must himself supplement these few notes by trials of the various baits which may suggest themselves one of the chief pleasures of angling being found in the various schemes and dodges resorted to the sense of smell appears to be highly developed in the roach and such things as saffron balsam of tolu aniseed asafoetida and other strong smelling drugs are at times used with success roach will usually be found at the junction of a broad with a river as they wait there for the food to drift down to them the bream a bramus brama whose bellows like shape is well known to all anglers runs much larger than the roach its ordinary weight is from two pound to three pound though twelve pound and fourteen pound fish have at times been taken it is however a very uncommon thing in england to take one exceeding five pounds bream are very gregarious so that when once among them a heavy bag may be soon made they spawn during may and may be angled for from june to october bream being a strong and weighty fish a rod stiffer than that used for roach and a strong silk line must be used and it will also be as well to have a larger hook number nine or number ten a large float is not necessary as these fish bite in a very timid manner 
but great attention must be paid and the fish struck promptly now comes the tug of war for they fight in a very game manner if the place is tolerably clear plenty of line may be given and the fish played the landing net will again be in requisition in the winter bream when caught will stand an astonishing amount of cold on the continent they are kept for hours and transported long distances by simply wrapping them in snow and inserting a piece of bread steeped in brandy in their mouths when thus treated they will recover after being out of the water for hours bream love to get into deep holes and therefore silence and caution must be observed when angling for them when caught do not be too eager to clutch them for next to eels they are the slimiest of all freshwater fish and will daub one's clothes over to an alarming extent unless great care is taken various baits may be tried wasp grubs greaves dew worms red paste etc but a bait seldom refused is the common and easily procured earthworm the bite of the bream may easily be mistaken for the little nibble or bob of the minnow so that unless it be responded to by an instantaneous strike very few fish will be landed bream love the deep holes in the rivers or broads the former for choice as they like running water better than still the strike is simply a quick movement from the wrist with just force enough to dart the barb of the hook into the mouth of the fish and not as some imagine with such power as to jerk its head from its body the bait should be only a few inches from the bottom ground bait of barley meal and chopped worms or mashed potatoes with shreds of beef and a few gentles may be used with success work these ingredients or any others that may suggest themselves to you into lumps which drop into the holes or other haunts of the fish who will then congregate in large numbers the early morning and the evening will be found the best times to take bream the heaviest fish frequently bite in the most timid manner so do not forget the motto strike while the iron's hot or the bream bites as to its gastronomic qualities well tastes differ the french are fond of this fish while an english writer says they are a combination of bones and nastiness the carp cyprinus carpio is a handsome fish and the very antithesis of the bream from an epicurean point of view its flesh is esteemed such a delicacy that ponds are in many places made especially for keeping them until fit for table they are very long-lived often exceeding the century this has been proved many times by attaching metal rings to their tails when young and then keeping them in ponds by these means some have been proved to be one hundred and fifty years old carp grow to a very large size they have been taken weighing from fifteen pounds to eighteen pounds and on the continent even more for some unknown reason they are not so numerous in the broads as other fish which is very strange seeing that they are excessively prolific a carp one pound in weight being opened was found to contain two hundred and ninety five thousand eggs one of five pounds four hundred and sixty thousand and a large one of ten pounds upwards of seven hundred thousand the ovary of this latter fish actually weighed more than the whole of the remaining portion carp spawn in may and should be angled for from june to october and even later they are very tenacious of life 
and may be kept in a net filled with moss or grass for a week or more with an occasional wetting i cannot give the novice much hope of catching many of these beautiful fish for they are exceedingly wary and shy of anything uncanny in the form of a baited hook still they are to be caught by the exercise of patience if the right kind of bait be used and quietness be observed the rod should be strong and pliable and the tackle as fine as possible compatible with strength the line should be a running one thin but strong and long enough for big rushes which these fish often make a number eight or number nine hook is the best to use if you have a bamboo rod so much the better this being both light and supple keep the shots on your line as far from the bait as possible and use a small quill float the size of this last article depends upon the depth of water and consequent weight of shot employed scores of different kinds of bait are recommended among others a blue bottle fly pastes of various colours grains of boiled corn a boiled green pea etc but after you have tried all you will find a well scoured red worm to be the most seductive some anglers flavour the paste baits with honey or treacle but these fancy kinds rarely succeed evening is the best time to angle for carp quite into the twilight and even after dark by the feel good bags are made an old angler when asked what was the best bait for carp replied patience and without this it is useless to try to catch them as we have seen for bream you should strike on the instant of detecting the bite but with a carp this would be a foolish and useless proceeding when you notice a bite let the fish take the bait a little distance and then strike gently when hooked let him have as much line as he wants with an occasional quiet check presently his vigorous efforts to escape will tire him when you may carefully land him without much fear of a broken line or rod for ground bait use shred beef oatmeal and water with a little treacle or honey added another sort though not quite so pleasant to prepare is made by chopping up a number of worms and gentles and mixing them with some well soaked bread crumb then add a small portion of clay or earth and sink at the required spot the following curious idea is prevalent concerning frogs and carp but i am not in a position to vouch for its correctness it is said that frogs will mount a carp's back to which it will cling with its hind legs while it thrusts its forelegs into the corners of the fish's eyes and thus rides it like an old man of the sea till it wastes and wastes and dies the rud or pink eye leuciscus erythrophthalmus may in the season be caught nearly as quickly as its latin name can be pronounced it may be angled for in much the same manner as the roach rud are gregarious and when once you get among them in a deep hole with a gravelly bottom as on hickling broad you may with care nearly empty the spot before the fish become alarmed at their diminishing numbers great diversity of opinion exists respecting this fish walton infers that it is a cross between the roach and bream other writers class it as a pure bred fish of a quite distinct species while others again maintain that it is a hybrid of the roach and carp in france where it is called the roche carp it attains a greater size than in england and is esteemed a great delicacy in the broads 
rudd may be met in shoals the average weight of these fish is from half a pound to three quarters of a pound barley meal and brewer's grains or a few gentles mixed with soaked bread will draw them together the grub of the daddy long legs called the leather jacket used as a fly should be tried as also the wasp grub or soldier these grubs should not be allowed to get into a too forward state of development or they will become brittle and difficult to keep on the hook three or four pellets of brewer's grains have been tried with great success even when the fish were a little off their feed when they are on their feed they will bite at almost anything especially when it is raining the pike esox lucius and young fish of the same tribe are known by various names such as loose jack pickerel etc and are veritable freshwater dragons consuming all fish which come in their path except the perch which is armed with a chevaux de frise on its back which would be awkward for the pike's gullet neither does he tackle the diminutive stickleback as he too is well armed as to size i am almost afraid to state what dimensions these fellows will grow certainly to thirty pounds and even more though in this district very few are taken larger than twenty pounds at whittlesea mere one was caught in eighteen twenty weighing about fifty two pounds and stories are in circulation of monsters in the deep mountain locks of scotland wales and ireland of sixty pounds and seventy pounds weight but who has seen them what do you think of this for a pike i think it more like a whale but here it is in fourteen ninety eight a person caught at kaiserlauten near mannheim a pike which was nineteen foot long and weighed three hundred and fifty pounds its skeleton was for a long time kept at mannheim round its neck was a brazen ring capable of enlargement by springs on this ring the emperor frederick barbarossa caused the date to be engraved a d twelve thirty five two hundred and sixty seven years before its capture the pike certainly attains a patriarchal age and gigantic size but we cannot quite believe all we read without the occasional aid of the salt cellar the stories of its voracity are legion fish flesh and fowl falling a prey to its insatiable appetite water hens coots ducks and all kinds of fish even his own species are swallowed whole by this ravenous water wolf a list of strange meals eaten by the pike lies by me as i write from which i extract the following a swan's head and neck a mule's lip a girl's foot a man's hand some young kittens and a large piece of bacon pike spawn for the first time when three years old about the end of march they come out of the deep water in which they lie during the winter enter the shoal waters of the dikes and commence to spawn which operation lasts about a couple of months when twelve months old the pike is about nine inches long at two years twelve inches to fourteen inches and at three years attains a length of about eighteen inches or nineteen inches after this age it continues to grow no doubt to a great size but certainly not to nineteen foot as the german one is reported to have done watermen have a curious way of snaring the pike during hot summer days during july and august these fish love to lie near the surface of the water basking in the sun to snare them our friend the fisherman proceeds thus 
he takes a stout ash stick or straight sapling ten foot or twelve foot in length from the thin end of which is suspended a noose of copper wire this wire is previously heated in burning hay to make it pliable he then walks along the sides of a river or dyke until peeping cautiously over the margin he discovers a basking pike then expeditiously and cautiously he drops the noose over the pike's head gives a jerk and the deed is done this mode of capture is however never resorted to by gentlemen who follow angling for pastime and not for a living the legitimate modes are known as trolling spinning and live baiting these methods i will endeavour to describe without entering into the minutiae which would occupy too much space a cloudy sky a nice gentle breeze and a day not too warm is the best time for pike fishing a rod twelve foot in length is about the handiest though some prefer one a couple of feet longer a certain degree of stiffness and strength is indispensable the line must be a long one not less than fifty yards or sixty yards of waterproof trolling line neatly wound on a winch at the butt of the rod the hook for trolling is the ordinary double-headed one for pike and upon the shank is a little cylinder of lead a couple of inches long the shank of the hook ends in an eye through which the gimp trace is fastened the other end being in turn secured to the line one or more swivels are usually attached to the trace but may be dispensed with a small roach makes a good bait dead gorge bait and is placed upon the hook thus take your roach and with a pair of scissors cut off the tail close to the flesh and one of its side fins which will cause it to have an eccentric rotary motion in the water now get out your baiting needle and fix the loop of your trace to the little hook at the end of the needle then thrust the needle gimp and all down the throat of the roach and out at the tail draw the needle quite through and detach at the same time drawing the gimp through till only the end of the loop hangs from the mouth of the bait attach the hook and draw the shank into the stomach till only the barbs of the hooks protrude from the mouth it only remains for the line to be attached to the gimp and you are ready for the first cast the most likely places for pike are in pools by the side of beds of weeds rushes or reeds or even in the rivers themselves but in the latter case always fish within two foot or three foot of the bank cast your bait lightly and let it sink then draw it slowly with a swimming motion from side to side and in all conceivable directions when the knock or run as the bite of the pike is called occurs there will be no mistaking it the fish will simply clutch the bait in its jaws and swim off with it to his haunt let him go do not ask him to stay with you in fact pay out your line slowly so as not to check him now comes the patience test for eight or ten minutes not less nor more you must simply wait though you may be bubbling over with suppressed excitement at the end of that time you may reel up any loose line till you feel the fish then give a sharp tug for the rest you must play him according to the special circumstances of the case exercise patience and in his rushes give him an occasional turn until by and by when your quarry begins to tire you may quietly wind him in and thus secure your first loose in order to save time have three or four hooks ready baited at hand 
they can be kept in a tin box filled with moist bran spinning is performed with a live bait a roach or fair-sized dace for choice let them rather incline to a small than to a large size what is termed a flight of hooks a most frightful looking implement is generally used one hook is fastened through the lip of the live bait and another through the flesh near the tail leaving a set of three hooks secured in the form of a triangle to depend from the back of the fish quite freely some authorities advocate the use of two sets of these triangles of hooks while others aver that less fish are missed when but one set is employed to use this flight when properly baited sufficient line should be run off the reel upon the bank to allow of the flight being cast to any given spot then with a swaying motion of the rod which requires some practice a cast may be made if after a short period no response is received from mr pike reel up the line draw the bait out of the water and repeat the cast if you get a bite or a knock as it is termed from the fish strike very hard at once and play him giving and taking in line according to his rushes until he turns on his side exhausted when you may gently draw him to the side of the bank or boat and gaff or net him in see that your line is strong your hooks very sharp and that your reel runs freely there are various kinds of artificial spinners which in turbid water are very killing namely the artificial live bait the norfolk spoon bait with red tassel and herder's plano convex pike will also at times rise at a large coloured fly but as very little fly fishing is indulged in in norfolk i cannot say if this bait is generally successful although i am informed that it is live baiting or snap fishing is largely practised here as much simpler tackle is required the apparatus consists of a small hook on gimp from which depends an ordinary triangle of hooks above this at a distance of ten inches or twelve inches is a leaden plummet of elongated form and a swivel a small but lively roach is used for bait this is secured to the small hook which is passed through the skin of the back near the fin a float will be required so that the bait may not go deeper than mid-water where it should be allowed to swim about in all directions when a bite occurs do not be in a hurry to strike when you do strike do so boldly and vigorously when once hooked play the pike as you would in spinning or trolling a frog is at all times a tempting bait but should you be unable to procure any other bait than perch if you cut off the spinous back fins before using you will find that a hungry pike will not turn up his nose at it there are many other baits which may be tried such as a mouse small bird or eel cut into lengths each on particular days proving efficacious september october and february are the best months for pike fishing though november also is accounted to be good some pike fishers favour a breezy frosty morning but september will be found the finest month for the pleasure seeker in these waters see that you do not place your fingers too near the mouth of a pike for the purpose of removing the hooks until he is quite dead as his teeth are set in rows like those of an alligator and are as sharp as needles lastly remember that patience and skill are the two chief desiderata required in trolling especially of the true follower of the immortal isaac walton the tench 
tinker vulgaris is a handsome plump looking fish with small scales and a very shiny coat it is fond of weeds and muddy places and being shy is not often seen except during hot weather when it loves to bask in the sun in some quiet nook stagnant or nearly still water suits this fish better than that of rivers tench intended for market are kept in ponds and fattened on meal being extremely tenacious of life they are frequently brought to market alive in wet moss so that if not sold they may be returned to the water to await some other epicure's pleasure their spawning time is the month of june like many other freshwater fish they are very prolific as many as two hundred and ninety seven thousand eggs having been obtained from a four pound fish if a few tench be left undisturbed for two or three years their progeny will stock quite a large pond tench attain a large size and weigh as much as seven pounds or eight pounds not many years since a monster thirty three inches long and weighing eleven and a half pounds was captured during the cold weather these fish bury themselves in the mud the best time to angle for them is from may to september and even as late as november if the weather be open good bags may be made a triangle of small hooks is usually employed to capture this fish as he is a very delicate biter in fact he rather sucks at the bait than bites it you must give him time and even when he takes the float quite under water do not be in a hurry to strike but wait till it reappears then if there are indications of his attentions observable strike if you hook him he usually takes to the mud at the bottom though you must endeavour by keeping a strain on the line to prevent his doing so check all his dives and rushes until he becomes exhausted then draw him coolly to the side and land him by deftly inserting the landing net under him a muggy drizzly day is the best time to take this fish you cannot be either too early or too late for him as he does not usually bite freely during the middle portion of the day some anglers make good bags by baiting with large dew worms and in france during hot weather the small white garden slug is found useful i think however that in this district the angler cannot do better than use the common red garden worm varied occasionally with a piece of parboiled potato the bait should actually touch the ground whether in a river or pool beef cooked and chopped fine mixed with bran or wheat meal is a useful ground bait some add a little sugar or honey to this and moisten it with a very little milk just enough to make it adhere another ground bait is composed of bran worked up with bullock's blood and a few chopped worms the eel anguilidae whose serpentine form is too well known to require any description here is found well where is he not found he may be taken in broad pool river or ditch in clear or muddy water and in any weather in the way of food he has no dislikes and will eat anything that comes in his way nothing is too delicate or too distasteful for him he is found in most unlooked-for places in fact during the dewy nights of late summer he will go for long crawls in the wet grass of the surrounding fields and will visit neighbouring ponds having no connection with the stream he frequents there are three varieties of the eel namely the sharp-nosed the broad-nosed and the snig the last is sometimes classed with the first named the sharp-nosed eel attains the larger size 
in the medway eels of this variety have been taken of enormous size some of them weighing from twenty pounds to twenty five pounds each and being nearly six foot in length the greatest size to which they attain in this district is about three foot and the greatest weight ten pounds to twelve pounds the broad-nosed eel very seldom exceeds four pounds in weight and the snig though esteemed the finest for the table is even smaller still the eel is a long-lived fish many instances are on record of its attaining three score years and ten and even much more during the winter eels lie torpid in the mud and do not take food of any kind like the bear they live on their own fat as they are found to be much thinner in the spring than in the autumn in angling for them a strong stiff rod a strong line and a rather large hook will be required it is found expedient to have a swivel or two on the lower end of the line so as to prevent it from kinking with the evolutions of the eel the hook should be upon gimp as the eel's teeth quickly cut through the thickest gut or silk line garden worms are the best bait if when you draw the fish to the surface you let its tail just dangle upon the bottom of the punt or the earth it will not wriggle about so much it is best to put your foot upon it as quickly as possible the head may then by a longitudinal cut be divided when the hook will drop out a cut across the back severing the spinal cord kills an eel instantly another way of taking eels is by spearing this is done with a kind of trident notched at the edges and placed upon a long pole this implement is variously called a dart pick glaive or spear the method is easily acquired it simply consists of prodding the mud with the tines of the spear and occasionally bringing it to the surface to see if an eel has been transfixed sometimes two or three are impaled at once the novice must be careful not to overbalance himself or dig the spear so deep into the mud that he cannot withdraw it before the boat is carried away by the current this sport if kept up for three or four consecutive hours will be found rather tiring after dark is the best time to select for spearing and august and september are the best months another method of taking eels called bobbing is performed thus dig a large quantity of garden worms the more the better get a long thin packing needle and a hank of coarse worsted proceed to thread the needle with worsted and then thread the worsted with worms lengthwise when you have got a large bunch go to the river after dark and having attached a strong cord to the bunch heave it overboard during the day you will of course have noted the most likely spots wait a few minutes and then draw up your bob quietly when if you have selected a favourable spot the eels will be found with their teeth entangled in the worsted shake them off put them in a bucket of water and continue taking fresh casts as long as the eels bite night lines for eels are permissible and may only contain one baited hook it is optional how many of these lines you put out that depends on the fisherman's patience they should be baited with worms or slugs roach dace or minnows if procurable will prove very enticing they should be used in the same manner as when trolling for pike the perch perca fluvia tillis, is a handsome and game fish and easily recognisable by the novice in the gentle art his greenish olive back golden sides with their tiger-like stripes and spiny dorsal fin 
render him very conspicuous the perch casts its spawn in april during which month it may be seen floating in long strings on the water the number of over contained in a single fish is marvellous many years since a swiss naturalist pico took the trouble to count the eggs in a fish weighing about sixteen ounces or eighteen ounces and found the number to be upwards of nine hundred and ninety thousand fancy this for a single family a four pound perch is reckoned a large one in the broad district though heavier ones are occasionally taken a fish weighing a pound a very nice size will try one's tackle severely and mark this that if you are unfortunate enough to lose a perch that is if it should get back among its companions a stampede will follow and then good-bye to your sport in that particular spot for all the fish will take their departure in alarm the largest authentic capture in england i ever heard of was that of a nine-pound fish taken from the serpentine hyde park london some years since but in the church of lulia in lapland the head of a perch of enormous size is preserved it is nearly twelve inches long and as the head of a perch is rather less than two-sevenths of the entire length this particular fish must have been about forty-three inches or forty-four inches in length and would probably weigh from twenty-eight pounds to thirty pounds there would seem to be a mistake somewhere or possibly it may have been the head of a giant perch lucia perca brought from the caspian sea where they are often caught over a yard long the perch is a capital fish for the table after the middle of july when it assumes its bright colouring from may to july it is out of season of a dull leaden colour and with an unpleasant flavour the angling season commences in august and the sport may be prosecuted as long as the weather keeps open enough to enable one to angle without fear of being frozen to the spot the most useful rod is one about twelve foot or fourteen foot in length with a fairly strong top joint the tackle should also be strong a silk line with a length of gut at the end and a rather large hook number five or six on gimp will answer well in perch fishing two or even more hooks may be used in fact the most approved way seems to be by paternoster fishing the paternoster is a gut line about one yard long from which two three or four hooks depend at equal distances a small leaden plummet should be suspended at the end of the flight so as to keep all taut and prevent the fouling of the hooks the method of using this apparatus is to cast it into a likely pool and let it sink until the bullet touches the bottom then draw it up a few inches and move it gently from side to side to you and from you and in every direction until a bite is felt then wait for a second or two and if another tug be felt strike when with very little trouble the fish may be landed the perch is at times rather capricious in his taste so that it will be found a good plan to try a different bait on each hook till his particular taste is discovered when it will be wise to bait all the hooks with his particular choice till he is tired of it then give him a change perch may also be taken by trolling with a very small roach in the same manner as recommended for pike but with smaller tackle the bait used may be either worms very small roach or minnows live shrimps when procurable 
are often used as a bait with great success if live bait be used the hook should either be run through the lip or the skin of the back when found to be dead replaced by a live one as the more lively the bait the more attractive will it be when simply angling with a single hook a cork float will be necessary but the smaller it is the better the size of the float must be regulated by the depth of water to be fished perch will take a number of baits so you may try a small frog which should be hooked by the skin of the thigh and allowed to swim about in mid-stream both red and white gentles garden slugs etc also prove successful but for these waters nothing is equal to the red garden worm these worms are best found after a shower of rain when they come out of their holes a method of procuring worms which i find easier than digging is to throw a couple of pails of water on the mould after waiting a short time take a spade thrust the blade into the ground as far as possible and wriggle it from side to side flatways for a space of a couple of minutes then upon looking on the ground you will perceive the worms appearing on the surface they should then be picked up placed in a can filled with moss and sprinkled with new milk next day they will be ready for use but are better if kept two or three days changing the moss occasionally perch love a hard gravelly bottom and are seldom found in a muddy locality in the bure especially near acle bridge several trout of from three pounds to four pounds weight have been taken with a spoon bait during the past twelve months would it not be a good idea for some angler who is used to fly fishing to try his skill with a few casts between acle bridge and thurnmouth some general remarks the broads vary greatly in depth hickling is from three foot to five foot nearly everywhere except in the channel which is marked out by posts barton broad is in many parts very shallow and i believe nowhere exceeds eight foot or nine foot in roxham you have deep water in some parts twelve foot and fourteen foot fritton decoy has still deeper water there are spots in it known to the brethren of the angle sixteen foot or eighteen foot deep there is very little current in any of the broads the rivers near their mouths are during the run of the tide rather swift and vary greatly in depth perhaps nine foot to ten foot would be about the average the angler will therefore see that little can be done without the use of a leaden plummet the following is a list of angling necessaries which may be added to by the expert a couple of rods one long and light the other shorter and firmer or a fairly long rod with two or three top joints of various thicknesses reels for running tackle baiting needles of various sizes and a packing needle lines gut silk and trolling hooks on gut and gimp of various sizes swivels etc traces paternosters eel line spoon baits etc floats quill cork and luminous disgorger clearing ring and drag for lost lines landing net jointed to fold bait tin and gentle box plummets split shot pliers cobbler's wax and the other little sundries which complete an angler's outfit the following is from the author's table of fish of the broad district giving name of fish best time for angling the best places size of hook baits etc one carp 
from March to October, in still water or ponds, hook ten or eleven, baits, dainty morsels required, green pea, piece of cherry, etc. Two, bream, from March to September, in deep, slow rivers, hook nine to eleven, baits, greaves, lobworms. Three, dace, any time, in rivers and broads, hook twelve or thirteen, baits, pace, rice grains. Four, eels, any time, everywhere, hooks eight to ten, baits, lobworm, piece of fish, anything. Five, miller's thumb, from April to October, in dikes and shallows, hook number thirteen, baits, lobworm, piece of fish, rice grains, anything. Six, minnow, from March to September, in broads and shallows, hook number thirteen, baits, lobworm, piece of fish, rice grains, paste, anything. Seven, perch, from February to November, in deep holes in broads, hooks, eight or nine, baits, lobworm, fly, minnow. Eight, pike, from August to February, in weedy rivers and broads, hooks, four to six, baits, roach and dace, used as live bait. Nine, pope, from April to October, in still pools, hooks, ten or eleven, baits, paste. Ten, roach, from July to April, in rivers and broads, hooks, eleven to thirteen, baits, pace, gentles, lobworm. Eleven, rudd, from April to September, in broads, hooks, nine to eleven, baits, lobworm, gentles. Twelve, smelt, from August to January, in estuaries or braden, hooks, eleven to thirteen, baits, lobworm, gentles, piece of eel, nets. Thirteen, stone loach, from May to September, in still pools, hook number thirteen, baits, worms or gentles. Fourteen, tench, from May to September, in muddy rivers, hooks, ten to twelve, baits, delicate morsels, according to fancy. Fifteen, trout, from March to August, in deep, fast rivers, hooks, seven to nine, baits, fly or spoon bait. Although not strictly within the scope of this work, I may, on passant, mention sea fishing. Place and flat fish of all kinds are taken from the jetties at Yarmouth, and, by taking a boat, good sport may be had chopsticking for mackerel, whiting, and haddock, large quantities of these fish being caught here by this popular method. Soles and flounders are taken by laying long lines about a quarter of a mile from the shore. The bait used is the common lugworm, dug from the sand at low water, or mussels. From October to March, good hauls of codling and cod are made by casting from the shore, or by laying long cod lines, baited as for soles in the summer. Although the beach at Yarmouth is shelving and sandy, very little seining seems to be done, albeit it is essentially a summer method, and at times very profitable. In two nights, with a crew of four, I have brought in over 400 pairs of soles, the largest being 22 inches long. I must own, however, that it is hard work rather than pleasure. 
mackerel in the season may be caught from a boat with rod and line bait with a piece of scarlet cloth or a piece of fresh fish of any kind they will sometimes take the spoon bait if allowed to trail after the boat whiting will take the lugworm or fresh fish as a bait have a sinker a foot beneath the hook and let this plummet just touch the bottom slack tide is the best time that is at the top of the flood or low ebb i tried a curious plan for catching whelks off haysborough last summer i procured an old iron tire off a cartwheel and a piece of herring net the net i fastened round the tire so as to form a kind of bag net and in the bottom of this i fastened a heap of fish offal to the edge of the tire at equal distances i next tied four strong cords meeting at a point above the centre to this i attached twenty fathoms of line and a leather buoy i now took my whole apparatus out half a mile to sea and hove it overboard it was left for four days and then i took a boat and went off and after a time found the boy took it aboard and hauled on the line till the boat was right over it and then drew up my net the contents were peculiar about a peck of whelks two crabs two soles and a copper oil can and now i will conclude this chapter by remarking that although i do not put myself forward as an authority in angling matters yet if the instructions i have given are duly carried out not even the merest tyro will come home empty-handed it is almost impossible to give instructions that will prove effectual at all times and under all circumstances but i have endeavoured to give a general idea of the methods of angling for the various kinds of fish which are to be found in the land of the broads end of chapter eighteen end of the land of the broads by ernest richard suffling